Hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome to the stream, folks. How's everyone? How's everyone doing? Hey, what's up, Seth? Uh, yeah, I'll explain in, in just a moment, but if you guys want to already submit some games or positions, um, simply whisper to Chess Dojo Live in the uh, Twitch chat, and uh, uh, and I'll I'll be taking a look at uh, as many as I can um, today. But uh, yeah, let's get into it. Let me explain what this is. This is Diagnose Your Chess. This is a weekly show that I do for Chess24 and CoChess.com. And uh, on this show, what I like to do is I like to look at viewer games and help people figure out how to improve their uh, chess. So what I have been doing uh, for this show for the last couple of weeks is I've been asking folks to uh, submit games that they want to take a look at. Um, the only restriction I have is that it can't be a game that you won. It has to be a game that either you lost or you drew, uh, because I think these are the best games to learn from. And uh, I'm always happy sharing, you know, my losses. So I feel like we should be generally okay with looking at our losses and our failures as and our mistakes, as this is usually where we can improve our chess uh, the most. So I'll give you guys a sec to submit uh, games. And um, the way I'll uh, kind of go through it is I'll ask for just one or two interesting moments or uh, positions that you have a question on, you weren't sure what to do or how to play the position. Um, I don't want to necessarily look through the whole game, but rather pick out one or two instructive moments uh, that I think everyone could uh, possibly learn from and hopefully give you guys some advice on as well how to, how to handle uh, typical positions. So yeah, if you want to submit a game, uh, please whisper the link to Chess Dojo Live in Twitch. Um, okay, let's see if we have... Okay, we have one. So yeah, we'll start with this game from Seth, and I'll give everyone... The show always starts off slow. Every week starts off a little slow, and then as people pile in, <laughs> the line, the line just, uh, just picks up. Um, okay, so we have a game here from Seth. And, um, and, uh, yes, yeah, Seth, if you have a, uh, a particular moment, uh, about this that you had a, a question about, please let me know. Otherwise I'll just quickly go through the game and, and let you know what I think. Um, but yeah, let me paste this one in here. It didn't work. I might need the link to the game set. I might need the link. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna need the link to the game. The PGN doesn't always get uh, read so easily. Oh, cool, cool. Thank you, thank you. All right, guys, one moment while I download this game. Oh, let me. Pause the music, actually. I mean, we could keep the music on. I just think some people find it uh, distracting. Okay. Hopefully this works. Sweet, though. Not sure if it's going to import the full game. Yep, couldn't figure out the full game. All right, we're gonna have to download it <laughs> and upload it. <laughs> there we go. Oh, still only 14 moves, wow. Okay, sorry, I gotta first clear all the, all the notes from it, okay. Fifth time's the charm. Here we go. <laughs> no, Joel, right on time. We are still taking submissions if you guys want to whisper to uh, Chess Dojo Live. Happy to look at as many games as I can. All right, here we go. Hey, Martin in the YouTube chat. What's up, YouTube? <laughs> 
All right, so this is uh, Seth's game. He's playing white here. So Seth is rated around 1440. His opponent is rated uh, 1860, so a couple hundred points higher. And this is a 90 plus 30 game. So this is uh, classical time control. So very serious game, actually. Um, and we have here Semislav. White takes on d5. Okay, e takes d5. Queen c2. g6. Bishop g5. Bishop e7, e3. Okay, kind of a normal opening. Knight d7, castles, castles, rook c1, king g7. So Seth has a question about the f3, e4 plan. And yeah, I mean, this is a typical plan in this kind of structure. So we would usually refer to this as a Carlsbad structure coming from the Queen's Gambit decline. And basically it's defined by white having these like five pawns and an open C file and black having these four pawns and an open E file. And of course these three pawns on the king side. So this like well-known structure, uh, Carlsbad, usually comes from the queen's gambit decline. Here we actually get it from a Slav move order, which is a little bit rare, um, but it happens. The way we normally get the structure is through the QGD with like knight C3, knight F6, White takes immediately, goes bishop g5, c6, e3, and we have the exact same structure here. And um, it can be useful to study these specific uh, kinds of positions because they can give you like ideas of what to do in the middle of the game. So one such idea is for white to develop um, with, let's say, bishop to d3, black castling, and putting the knight on e2. And the advantage of putting the knight on e2 is that it lets you play uh, this exact pawn move, f3, and control the e4 square. So this is definitely a very thematic idea for these kinds of positions. Not only do you control the e4 and g4 squares, you can also try to build a strong center with e4 yourself. So this is absolutely one of the main plans in the position for white in this structure. Now, whether it works in every single position or not uh, is certainly dependent on, on what black does, but this is a big thing that white tries to do. So. Typical line could go like knight d7, let's say castles, rook e8, queen c2, knight f8. And then white can play like f3 here, for example. And the idea would be to one day play e4, the rook can come either to d1 or to e1. King usually swings over to h1, just so that you don't get bothered by any tactics on the diagonal. And basically white tries to build uh, the, the center. The second plan for white in these positions, just so we're all aware, is to go for the famous uh, minority attack. So in this position, instead of playing f3, for example, white could also consider playing a move like a3 or rook to b1. Um, and why can't I make moves? Okay, here we go. And this is a move that um, helps white push the b pawn. And so the idea behind this one is very simple. You go b4, b5, right? You take on c6, take on c6, and then you try to target that newly isolated pawn on the c-file. And white is a really easy position to do so. Uh, rook fc1, knight a4, and uh, the c6 pawn is going to be very, very simple to target. So this is kind of the second plan of the position. It's not as aggressive as the f3, e4 stuff, but it certainly can be very effective because you're just trying to create a weakness in your opponent's position and then put pressure on it. So pretty simple. Okay, so let's jump to the game. Now in the game we have um, a semi-slav, and here the difference is that when we get the structure, white has already committed the knight to f3. And this isn't necessarily like the worst thing in the world, but it is uh, an important drawback because I would say that the knight is kind of better placed on e2 in this structure because again, it opens up uh, the chance for white to play f3 later. Okay, so both players continue uh, normally. I like this move uh, for black, g6. Oh, it looks like <laughs> uh, the player who is playing black is in the chat as well, so that's cool. I can talk to both of you guys. Yeah, I like g6 here for black because it allows you to develop uh, the problem uh, light squared bishop. So g6 isn't always a good move in these positions, but here it is it is a good move because of uh, bishop f5. Uh, and black gets to uh, develop the, the bishop. And yeah, exactly. This bishop still can go to e7. The point of g6 is not to Fianchetto, so this bishop is actually still much better placed on one of these two squares. 
So e3, bishop f5, bishop d3. And now, um, uh, now basically I would say position is, is equal. Okay, so this was a key moment where white plays knight to d2 here, a5, f3. And let's see what happened in the game. Rook e8, e4, takes, takes, knight e5. Yeah, that looks like a problem. <laughs> that, that looks like a problem. So this might be a case where uh, our e4 push came too soon um, because it's very hard to, it seems it's hard to hold on to this pawn on d4. Black's queen is hitting this one. Our queen is, of course, under attack. And uh, if queen e3, uh, I think we're getting hit by one of these knights with like knight g4. Right, so queen e3, knight g4 happens. Queen d3, black repeats once. <laughs> queen back to e3. And now black figures out knight fg4 is the way to go. And uh, all of a sudden, white has huge problems, it seems. Yeah, so take, take, we get a bunch of um, captures, but black goes rook takes d8. And now if white takes this one, black can just take on d2. With, uh, looks like just super active rook and should, feels like completely winning endgame. I mean, so many pawns hanging in, in white's position. Um, I guess rook f2 holds on for now, but the, the e5 pawn is also very, very weak. Um, okay, so yeah, basically after this knight e5 shot, um, which, nice job uh, to black for finding this one. Um, seems like, yeah, we're just in big trouble because the center is just uh, not, not stable enough. So does that mean that e4 was wrong? Like in this exact position? Yeah, it feels like concretely simply doesn't work. Um, so now the question is, you know, do you need to have calculated that, right? Like, is that something that you should be anticipating? I think maybe it's like, you would have to see from here, right? When you're thinking about it from, from this position, e4 takes, takes, everything does look good. But yeah, if you look for resources for the opponent, you might notice 95 and you might notice that that's going to be leading to um, problems. It's certainly not uh, not easy. This isn't the, the simplest tactic to anticipate, a tactic coming from your opponent, but that is what white had to do uh, in this position. So that means that probably this, in this case, this f3, e4 plan might not have been the right thing to do here. Um, the other plan that you could certainly consider is rook to b1 and kind of transposing to a type of minority attack where you just, the idea is to play for b4, b5. If black goes a5, you'll play a3 and then b4. Rook f to c1, you try to get b5, try to create this weakness. And then your knight can swing around to d2, b3, try to use the uh, c5 square. Or if black allows, maybe somewhere knight e5. Uh, question, after bishop takes e7, was rook takes e7 better for black? I mean, it's possible. I'm not too worried about like the tactics in the game just because... It seems like um, black was just in, um, in in good shape here. So yeah, for sure black I think can take in this case on e7 and uh, it does look like this one is still hanging and this one is still hanging. So this also looks like white is basically busted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the yeah, the real issue is basically just the pawn on d4 uh, doesn't have kind of stable support. And, and black is able to take advantage of that with some precise tactics. Like it should be noted, if black did not have this move knight to e5, if this move simply didn't exist, uh, then white's position here would be quite good <laughs> because the pawns in the center are strong. We have like e5 coming and then a knight can jump to e4 and white's two pawns in the center would be quite active. So it's only because of this move. And unfortunately, white strategy just didn't uh, didn't work out. Now, apparently white actually won this game because of some insane mouse slip, according to the players. <laughs> That's neither uh, here nor there. So hopefully that was uh, that was useful and uh, for you, Seth. Um, unfortunately, e4 is like a very common plan, uh, but tactics are tactics and we have to um, we have to account for them. Uh, one thing I would note actually is that maybe we did 
mix up uh, the plans here a little bit, like just to crystallize the point. Because in general, in these positions, if you want to play for e4, then your rook on the c file is not necessarily super useful. It's actually going to be much more useful either on the d or the e files where it can support your pawns in the center. So if you do want to play more on the queen side, then I would suggest this rook shifts over to b1, you play for the minority attack, and then the other rook can use the uh, c1 square. So that's how I would kind of play the position. And you can play both plans. You can put your rooks on b1, c1, and still go knight d2, f3, and kind of threaten to play e4. But it doesn't mean you have to play e4. Basically, the idea is you would just keep the tension. Um, and by keeping the tension, you're always threatening to play e4. So let's say just for example, you make some random move king h1, which is like helping your position anyway, and then black plays knight to f8. Now you might be, you know, in a better position to, to play e4. Now that black doesn't have this like knight e5 trick. So a lot of times this playing this type of position is all about just being very flexible and waiting for like the right moment to um, kind of advance and always trying to like improve your position as much as you can before going for this like uh, sharp advance in the center. Okay, cool. So I have um, quite a few, yeah, just a few messages now. So let's go to Vic and then I got Joel. All right, Vic, let me know if you're in the uh, Twitch chat and let me know if you had a specific question about this game or any position um, that you were wondering about while I loaded in. Also, let me know what, uh, what color you are playing. I assume you're playing black. Yeah, absolutely, Seth. Hey, what's up, YouTube? Ash for YouTube, Moas here. I'm I'm gonna try to acknowledge YouTube's existence more often because I know we are also streaming to YouTube. It's just hard, you know, to interact with with multiple chats. <laughs> it's just difficult. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Vic, let me know if you're in the Twitch chat. Hopefully you're still there. Um, otherwise, Joel, you're on deck. And if anyone else wants to submit a game or position to um, be looked at, uh, all you need to do is whisper the link to the game to Chess Dojo Live in the Twitch chat. And I will see that. Yeah, this is actually one of the boards on Chess24. I feel like a lot of their streams, a very few of them use this one, but it's like, it's really nice. Actually, I need to adjust it a little bit. I like this little white cherry wood thing they've got going on. Hmm. Okay, don't see Vic in the chat. Oh, Vic is in YouTube. Okay, cool. All right, Vic. Well, let me know what is your question on this game. Um, was there anything you're wondering about or do you just want to do you just want my thoughts on on what happened? I believe we're playing black. Looks like black lost the game, so I hope we're playing black. <laughs> um, so let's see. We have Sicilian with bishop c4. Not really the best move. Uh, but okay. D4. And now we actually have transposed into um the uh, classical variation of the Sicilian, where white plays bishop c4, one of the main moves. So g6 here is absolutely playable, going for more of a dragon setup. King h1, castles, f4, queen b6, knight takes c6, b takes c6. Everything looks perfectly fine for black so far. I think in general, when we play like a dragon setup as black in the Sicilian, one of the advantages is that like if white doesn't go for one of the sharp kind of queenside attacking lines, like the Yugoslav attack and stuff like that, it's pretty much just a very comfortable game. Um, now, knight g4, 
Mm, I don't love these kinds of moves because a lot of times it's like it can be hard to follow up on this one because this knight is just kind of floating. Um, I feel like for me, the move bishop a6 would be a lot more natural just to start with this one. Um, and and then actually one idea for black is to maneuver the knight over this way, like knight d7, knight to c5. This can be one way to improve the position. Obviously the rook can go to b8. You can put this rook on, on e8 if you want. Uh, but I do like this position for black, especially the c6 pawn um, covers the, the d5 square quite nicely. Um, okay, but we got knight g4, queen f3, bishop a6, knight e2. Knight goes back to f6. Well, we didn't really lose a whole lot here. Bishop e3, queen c7, uh, rook f2, c5, c4. I like the c5 move because it like actually poses some problems for white, right? White, black has this threat to push c4, completely shut down the bishop, and can also go after this um, e4 pawn. So c4, bishop b7, knight g3. Uh, now this is a position where I would strongly consider h5. Yeah, I think engine agrees. Um, because not only do we threaten simply to play like h4 to harass the knight, but we also grab the g4 square. So this is definitely the move. I think white would probably have to go bishop c2 here. And then we can either play knight to g4 and like I mean, maybe even take on b2, but yeah, knight g4 looks like black would be getting some uh, some nice activity here. Rook b8 also possible. Um, in this case, I kind of feel like black should be looking at both sides of the board. I mean, the dragon bishop is always pointing towards the queen side. So in general, black's play in the Sicilian is considered to be on the queen side. But there are many cases where black can also kind of counterattack on the king side, especially when this bishop uh, is on b7, pointing this way. So <laughs> whenever you have like a fian kettled bishop, you know, you're always staring at one side of the board. But when you have two fian kettled bishops, you can kind of play everywhere. Because these two bishops, I mean, they, they really work extremely well together. And as soon as white, you know, opens anything up, some e5, f5, I mean, the bishops are gonna kind of dominate the board. Um, so bishop c6 is a reasonable move here. A lot of times the idea behind this one is to push uh, a5 and a4 and take some space on the queen side and go after this b2 pawn. The queen can also use the b7 square, which I think might be black's point. So bishop c2, rook b8, rook b1, queen a5. I mean, it actually looks really nice for black. The, I mean, I think black is doing great. Uh, bishop b3, queen a6, f5. Okay, so finally white decides we need some counterplay. Rook takes b3, <laughs> not expecting that one takes queen b7 takes takes I, it's a very interesting exchange sack uh, i'm not sure like if it was necessary but black's light squared bishop has now become an absolute monster on this board and like all the light squares in white's position are weak nine on g3 uh, is still weak so it looks like black has more than full compensation for the exchange now bishop e5 king g7 okay <laughs> rook is going to the h file g3 takes rook d2 it looks like black is completely winning but i don't think black won this game so this might be this might be some kind of uh, tragedy in the making queen a5 bishop h1 takes queen f3 i mean it looks like we're just on the verge of checkmate i'm expecting like a mate on every move but we take on h2 rook takes h2 uh, can't take, right? Because queen g2. So queen c3 check. e5. Bishop h6. King takes. And now unfortunately white has won the exchange and somehow gotten into this endgame. So if we had just taken with the rook here, it would basically be game over. Yeah, kind of unfortunate. I think black was very, very close to the win here. I mean, this would have just been it. One move, basically. Uh, so I'm wondering if maybe time trouble was was a factor here. That would obviously affect um, the play for both players. Um, but looks like white just managed to, to find a win in this endgame. 
b-pawn starts running and white's king is actually in very good position to deal with black's uh, incoming pawn so b7 g3 and yeah this is a, a loss for black pawns aren't can't do anything against uh, the blockade very unfortunate guys i mean it happens a lot of I like that this game was submitted because it's 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 something that's really really common, um, very very common when you have like a great position and you just can't can't finish it off. Uh, no, the the final end game at the end there should be is losing because um, the pawns are simply stuck and and white's king and rook are are too strong, so nothing black can do. White's king and rook just slowly slowly pick off one and then then the other. So the end game was lost for a few moves. It wasn't lost the whole time, but I can imagine being black here and being totally demoralized that all of a sudden you have to play this position. I, I, at this point, it's like, I mean, still very, very complicated. Maybe the, the best, yeah, like earlier, earlier, like black could have definitely gone in some more play like this. Yeah. So I think we kind of messed this one up a little bit because we go here, we take, we kind of trade off the wrong pawns because now our two pawns are very, very slow. So this was probably the last moment to push e4 and at least try to get like the three pawns going here. I think white is still better because the rook is going to, is going to outplay the, the bishop here, but it's very, very complicated. Um, so we kind of misplayed this one, but to me, this isn't really the, the key point of, of the game. I think once we get into this end game, it's like, okay, we could have played the end game better, but the, the disaster has already happened, <laughs> so to speak, because this position, I mean, was so good. Like, I mean, the, the middle game was fine. And then we got, um, here, which I think black played quite well. And white goes G3 takes. <laughs> it looks like it just looks completely over and unfortunately just couldn't finish. Now, I don't like this bishop h1 move. I mean, I'm sure it's it's winning. It just feels like when we do this thing with bishop h1, queen on, it's like we're, we're just banking all of our hopes on this like one mate on, on g2. And it's like the bishop can attack more squares than just g2. So it's a very... It's a very awkward construction, actually, because all white needs to do is defend the seventh rank. And now your queen is like tied down to the bishop. So for me, this is where like, I mean, rook a7, queen f3, black is completely winning. It was winning the whole time, but I don't know. It, it's an odd move. I feel like the thing we should be doing is just trying to get the queen in, right? Like queen d7, queen g4, and should be game over. Um, so this is a position where you're just trying to bring your uh, all your pieces in. Everything just has to come in. Everything has to be as close to the king as possible. And you basically just play a game. Like, how do I get my pieces in as close as possible? That's kind of what black was doing because they play bishop h1, queen f3. So the queen does get in, but bishop on h1, it's like, I don't know, it's kind of funky. Still completely winning for black. Completely winning. Because, um, like, takes on h2, I mean, this was all, this all completely works. And it's just this one blunder at 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 this point with bishop h6. I'd be curious to know the time situation here. If this is a case where you know you're you're down to seconds and you know you're just playing on instinct, then okay, stuff happens. But if we had like any amount of time here, if we had a minute left on our clock, 30 seconds, you know, this is something that unfortunately we just have to keep track of. You know, you just have to keep the board objective. You have to stay like focused, you gotta breathe, you know, don't lose your mind, and just calmly look at the pieces and calculate, <laughs> you know, just calmly count squares, see what is attacking what and what's happening next. And, and you'll see, okay, king takes h6, white takes the queen, takes the rook. So you got to go rook takes h6. I mean, black played really a high level game so far. So I'm sure th this was possible for them to see, but some kind of accident happened at this point. And yeah, unfortunate blunder. Um, okay, Vic, I hope that was helpful if you're out there. <laughs> Um, unfortunate game. I do feel like you played well, just needed to find one more good move to, to finish it off. And, and that would have been it. Um, all right, let's jump to Joel's game. Okay. Let me put this one in.
And here we go. Okay, so Joel is playing black in this game. He's about uh, 2030 here on Lee Chess. I think this was a 10 minute game. And uh, opponent is rated 1990, so very similar. And uh, Joel writes, in this game, I don't know why I lost if I had much better control over the center. I would have assumed that if I outplay my opponent for center control, the win should be granted to me. <laughs> why did the chess gods not reward my superior devotion to the center? Let's take a look. Well, first thing is, you know, we are playing black, so it is hard to fight for an advantage out of the opening with the black pieces. A lot of times, best we can do is equalize, and we got to just keep that in mind. <laughs> this is the same Joel of YouTube fame, indeed. He, he plays instructive games. Okay, so castles h3, kind of a slow move for white. We go h6, this is better, hitting the bishop. Bishop h4, knight d7, c5, takes, takes, knight takes e7, takes, takes, e5, a6. Yeah, so far everything looks okay. f5. D1, we got E4. Now we have space, we don't necessarily have uh, the center, I would say, because I mean, at best all we had was E5 versus E3, but it's actually white's pieces that are a little bit more active here. Uh, anyway, I'm trying to think, look through the game here. Um, yeah, for the most part, we're still trying to, to equalize here as black. I don't really see anything that gives us the uh, advantage. Now, we take some space here, but our, we're still behind in development, right? So bishop e6, a3. And then with e4, this is always a committal move, right? Because it gives up the d4 square. And the light squares are, are potentially very weak. So b4, exactly the problem. Now knight on c5 is lost, and... Light squares become a big issue. Okay, okay, so let's go back. So that's kind of what happened. I mean, at first glance, it looks like we overextended uh, with the pawns, especially on, on the light squares. In fact, even at this point, maybe white goes b4, right? And, and the bishop on b3 is, is pretty annoying for, for black. Yeah, if we just think about just sample position, let's say, you know, we go knight e6, white plays bishop b3, and, and whether or not we, we go for the end game, this pin is just kind of awkward and we're having a hard time developing the rest of our, our pieces because of this. Yeah. Um, so, so f5 to me is, it's quite ambitious. Um, especially because we haven't haven't really like completed our our development here. I'm trying to think what I would have done differently in this game. Um, I think this is all fine. You know, to be honest, like I'm not sure I would play e5 here. Uh, because, well, as we saw in the game, e5 in the long run opens this diagonal, and white's light squared bishop gets a very strong diagonal to work with. So e5, I think, is a move that you can play in these positions, but mainly when you're trying to develop your bishop somewhere out here. So if the bishop needs to be somewhere on the king side, like bishop f5 or bishop e6, then okay, you can play e5. But in like Queen's Gambit decline positions, typically the bishop is actually really happy on b7. So like my first instinct here is a6, bishop goes somewhere, and then trying to play b5 and bishop b7. And then white's bishop can just like sit on, on b3. Now I don't know, we have to watch out for like these kinds of tactics. So let's let's be precise. Let's play knight c5 first. And then white will do something else, and then we'll go bishop b7 next. And I think if you get this set up, then I think you're very comfortable. 
Uh, and I remember seeing a lot of games from like guys like Capablanca and Alakine where they would just get the bishop to b7. They would get this knight to c5, you know, knight f6, bishop e7. They would control this e4 square, and that's kind of how they would... Everything would be uh, using this setup. In fact, if we go back to the opening a little bit, your move c5 here, I mean, I think it's it's perfectly fine uh, objectively. Um, but I've always been a fan of these simple setups with b6 and, and bishop b7. So, okay, white makes a move. Let's say we play bishop b7 here, castles. Let's say we take here, bishop takes, and c5, something like this. I've always thought this is actually extremely harmonious for black. I mean, it feels kind of simple and boring, but it's like all your pieces kind of coordinate with each other. Rook comes to c8, your knight is ready to use the c5 square. From there, your other knight will hit e4. The bishop is kind of like helping, the rook is helping on the c file. This bishop either gets traded off or goes to like f6 one day. Basically, every piece finds a square. Queen can come to e7, rook fd8. And uh, I don't know, it's kind of like a very nice coordinated setup. Um, not that you can't play c5 here, but it, that's kind of what we're playing for. So already it feels like to me, um, e5, although objectively might not be that bad, it does weaken a lot of light squares and it actually doesn't help our light squared bishop that much because we still would probably rather put it on b7, uh, all things considered. Like this diagonal is still kind of the best for this bishop. So all we're really doing with e5 is kind of in improving white's light square bishop for uh, the future. So then let's go to the end game. Because next big decision was e4. Uh, and, and Joel says this aims to get the, uh, the d3 square for the knight. But it seems like we're just not in time. Knight d4. Because we're not able to play bishop c4 in this position. I mean, we could play it, but the f5 pawn will hang. Maybe this was still critical to do something like this. I don't know if your opponent's going to sack the exchange here or go rook e1, um, but maybe this was the only way to kind of play the position and try to get some counterplay by putting something on, on d3. Because um, with e4, yeah, we give up this d4 square, and then on knight d3, white, of course, can always just take, so it's hard to, hard to see this happening. Um, and then what happens is we we end up getting busted on yeah, the light squares. Uh, so very interesting game. I mean, uh, at, at like for face value, it doesn't look like Black really did anything wrong in this game. Just like developing everything and, and getting it. Like this position doesn't feel like Black should necessarily be worse, but Black is actually under some pressure here. Like the e5 pawn now needs to be defended. And when it advances to e4... Uh, it gives up this d4 square. Now this isn't always like this isn't always a bad move. There are many positions. Let me really uh, stress this. There are many positions where advancing e4 in a similar fashion is absolutely a strong idea because the d3 square can maybe be more useful than uh, the d4 square. But this doesn't feel like one of those positions mainly because white can always just trade off on d3, and there doesn't seem to be a big a big threat of this one. Whereas the d4 square is like immediately useful for white, hitting the bishop, hitting the f5 pawn, and being very annoying. Especially the slight square bishop, I would say, is actually an important piece for us. Even though it feels like a bad bishop, because it's like hitting all of our pawns, it's also defending all of our pawns at the same time, and defending this critical diagonal to the king. So if we give up the bishop, it... White's bishop becomes much stronger, of course. Um, so yeah, just a few overextended moves, and and just like that, the this this position is already um, very very difficult for for Black. It seems like Black is pretty much losing material by force at this point. Uh, kind of just bad luck, to be honest. <laughs> like, it doesn't seem like this should just be immediately lost, but like the the exchange is the exchange is basically. Uh, can't be saved, it seems like. Okay, maybe here at king e7 was better, but anyway, this is not, not going to be a fun endgame to, to try to hold. Okay, Joel, hope that was helpful here. Um, I think the main thing to remember in these positions is that your your bishop just wants to go to e, uh, b7, and so you don't really need e5 in a lot of cases. All you have to do is just get a6, b5, and bishop b7, and you're you're good to go. Um, okay, guys, so let's see if we have some more games here. Looks like I have one from an empty box car. And um, yeah, if actually, oh, you don't have, okay, you just have the PGN. All right, let me try to 
copy this one in. It might not like it. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, I'm going to see if I can paste this one in. Right, it's over the board so you don't have a link to the game. Um, maybe if you wouldn't mind quickly uploading it to like Lee Chess or something and sending me the link to that. Because it has... The only way I'm able to upload games is if I have like uh, like a PGN file or some kind of blank PGN has a hard time reading reading stuff otherwise. And if anyone else wants to submit a game, what you need to do is just whisper to Chess Dojo Live in the Twitch chat. And uh, if you whisper a link to your game, I can take a look at it. Oh, Vic, you're in the YouTube chat. Shoot, I didn't see you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh man. Oh, so, okay. Okay. You had, you had three seconds on King takes H6. Yeah. Yeah. I figured. Yeah. The exchange sack was good. My friend, if you're still listening, I think the exchange sack was really, um, I mean, it wasn't the only way to play the position, but it was, uh, it was certainly viable and, and you, you ended up getting fantastic counterplay from it clearly. Okay, actually, in the meantime, I can just start playing Muzin because I have... Um, oh, if you can whisper the link to the same Chess Dojo Live account, that would that would work. Um, and let me, let me reset the board. Okay, there we go. Oh, cool. Oh, it's just a blank analysis board. <laughs> I'm not sure why it's blank. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, I'm just gonna start inputting some moves in. So I think we were we were black in this game, right? Five knight of three. D6, D4, takes, takes. Knight F6, Knight C3, A6, Bishop E2, E5, Knight F3, Bishop E7. All right, looks like it's going to be uh, Nidorf. Very cool. I'm not a huge Nidorf expert, but maybe I can I can help shed some light on some stuff. Uh, bishop c4, b5, bishop b3, bishop b7, q1, knight d7, bishop g5, rook c8. Okay, and um, Fred, Fred, did you have any any particular questions about this game or wondering about any uh, position in particular? Queen e2. Wait, bishop g5, oh sorry, 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 no rook c8, <laughs> queen e2 was played, oh and rook takes c3, nice, so we, we pop it. If the question is about the exchange sack, it's good. <laughs> In general, these exchange sacks are good if um, you're able to weaken the structure and get one pawn, especially this uh, e4 pawn. If you can get this e4 pawn for the exchange sack, Usually you get enough because then white's other pawns are pretty weak as well, and your your pieces are are quite are quite good. And this is when the king is castled king side. When the king is castled queen side, I think basically as long as you double the pawns, you're good to go. You don't even need to win a pawn. So if the king is on the queen side, you can just take on c3 in any position. Uh, famous game of Sessian Kasparov basically proves this. Uh, really fascinating game if you guys haven't seen it yet. Um, but when the king is castled king side, we don't always get as much compensation. But if we can grab this important central e4 pawn, then uh, definitely it's um, good for, for black. So white goes bishop d2.
and let's see knight d c5 c4 takes takes d5 looks right to me bishop b3 we take on d2 knight takes d2 bishop f6 so yeah we're just playing this position um not as if we like sack something but just like yeah just improving our position it's like is this is the secret to exchange sacrifices it's not like you have to calculate it all the way out to the win. You're just making a declaration, right? That your pieces are just as good as your opponents, if not better. Now, in this case, white happens to have a rook and black happens to have a dark squared bishop. But so what? One piece versus one piece. And which one of these pieces is like attacking more squares after e4? I would say the bishop is attacking more squares. So the bishop is kind of more useful in this position, you know, until the rook is able to, to open up and unleash itself. But black also has these very powerful pawns uh, that black can use to dominate more squares. So this is what gives black just a ton of compensation in the position. Now it doesn't make it easy, it just means we have good compensation. Okay, so rook ad1, queen c7, c4 good move for white fighting for the light squares d4 bishop c2 rook e8 knight b3 we take this one not sure if we should be taking this we go e4 but okay we couldn't play e4 without taking because the d4 pawn would be hanging so fair enough <laughs> f3 Okay, now we can't go d3 because uh, rook on e8 is hanging. White will just take. So queen c5, king h1, queen h5, f takes e4, queen e5. Oh, it looks like, yeah, it looks like we, we kind of bungle it here, start moving back and forth. And all of a sudden we've lost one of our important pawns. And all of a sudden white is like much better. So to me, it seems like, okay, this is already, this is, we've, uh, we've gone past the critical moment. Although we, we still have some counterplay here with black, but yeah, over already lost the threat. Right. So let's go back. Let's try to figure out what happened. I mean, it, it feels, it still feels quite good here because <laughs> the pawns are so strong. Your dark square bishop is good. F3. And we go here, king h1. Right, so we still can't go d3, we can't take on f3. Uh, only thing you can really do, it seems like, is play e3. But it, it feels like there was a reason you didn't want to, to do this one. I imagine you, you just didn't like the idea of having to deal with your opponent's light square blockade. Yeah, like how to follow up, right? Yeah, so clearly you, you understood this was an option, you just didn't want to do it. Um, but it feels like it's the only thing we can do because otherwise we're losing the e pawn. So based on that alone, I mean, We'd much rather have the pawn on e3, taking squares, taking a lot of space. I mean, it's not like the pawn is doing nothing. These pawns are blockaded, but what they're doing is they're restricting your opponent's pieces and making it hard for white to challenge you. So there might be some good plans from here, and, and we could talk about what I would do. For instance, like first plan that kind of try you know pops into mind is to line up the queen and bishop on this diagonal, right? And and ask white, how are you going to defend h2? Because the moment white plays g3, of course, your light square bishop becomes a monster. And that's kind of the power of the two bishops. They stand next to each other. They attack two diagonals. And sure, you can keep one bishop restricted, in this case, the light squared bishop, but you can restrict both bishops. One of the bishops is always going to be really, really annoying. So that would probably be the plan that kind of wins the game for black here, because I think your position is really good. If white isn't able to like break these pawns down and challenge them, then white's pieces are basically just sitting, you know, behind their own lines, not able to do anything while you're able to maneuver, you know, however you want. You can push the h-pawn forward, you can maneuver the bishop around, maneuver the queen. Maybe you even have, like, a chance to bring your rook over to the h-file, bishop e5. And, uh, yeah, if white can't challenge you, then white is basically just waiting to get checkmated. Um, I'm actually reminded of a famous game, uh, Aronian Navara. If you guys want, I can, I can quickly pull that up if that would be interesting for for chat might need a second to open it up but really really fascinating game that i think was similar to this one 
Oh, here we go. Okay, I already got it. You guys don't even have a chance to tell me that you're not interested. <laughs> Let me input this game afterwards and we'll, we can take a look at it just because I think it would be interesting um, to see. Uh, what about bishop e4 after e3? So long story short, this is the thing to do. Even if you don't know exactly how you're going to break through, um, keeping the pawns on the board is still going to be extremely restrictive for the opponent. So if bishop e4, let's take a look. I mean, let's just say we take and we take the, the pawn. Can white do anything here? Because basically we're still in control, so I, I still very much like Black's position here. I think you're just dominating the board. Now how to break through is an important question. There's some ideas like rook h4, again bringing the queen over to the dark squares like maybe queen e5, queen f4, bishop goes to e5, and then you try to line up on, on this diagonal. Of course you always have to watch out for like g3 stuff. Um, but the other thing is that like, I mean even in the end game, your pawns are going to be very very strong. Because in the end game, what you do is, let's imagine the queens are off the board, white's rooks are blockading these pawns. You know, your rook has carte blanche to like just go and attack anything you want. And then your king can walk in literally to the e4 square and, and, and completely harass white's rooks. And then one day, of course, you can also start pushing your f and g. And so this is potentially three connected passers at this point. So the thing is, is like if white literally does nothing but just tries to blockade, that just gives you an open hand, right, to do literally anything you want in the position. You still have more pieces that can get involved. Like so if you imagine some deep end game, you can absolutely just bring your king to e4 and start pushing f5, f4, g5, g4. And one day you'll push f3 in and, and the pawns will, will promote. Because uh, if white has no active counterplay, if they just are sitting, then basically you have you have all the time in the world to improve your position. Um, so, yeah, this is this I think would be, but but here you don't even have to trade queens. I'm saying like worst case scenario, you get an end game that you slowly win, but <laughs> you still win it. Here, queens on the board, I think you have a lot easier time because you can also create threats against white's king. So the idea would be like maybe queen e5, rook h4, maybe use the h pawn like h5, h4, h3 and try to open the diagonal. Your bishop can get involved uh, at some point like bishop h4. Yeah, basically if white is just sitting, it's only a matter of time before uh, you open up the king. Um, but interesting example, again, thank you for sharing. I, I mean, I think this kind of thing happens a lot where we, we find like a good sacrifice and then we just simply don't have enough energy or enough steam to kind of really uh, convert it. Because the sacrifice definitely was good. And I think you played it very, very reasonably for a good number of moves, like 10, 12 moves. I think you played it absolutely fine. Just here, we didn't have enough confidence in uh, the strength of, of these pawns. Um, okay, guys, let me show you this one example between Aronian and Navara. Because this game, I thought, was very impressive. I mean, really, really good high quality chess. I don't know if you guys know Levon Aronian, but yeah, the guy knows knows some tricks. Um, so here, Levon is playing white um, and Navarro is playing black. Navarro also very, very strong in his own right. I mean, 27, 30, 40 level GM, super, super talented. Uh, and they get a Queen's Indian. White goes B3. Bishop b4 check goes back. Okay, both sides develop basically pretty normal here. Knight e5, queen c2. Black goes c5 here, white takes on c5, goes rook ad1, kind of giving up the center, uh, but with this kind of pressure and, and leaving black with what they call hanging pawns. When you have two pawns in the center, both on open files, these are known as hanging pawns, and they can be strong, they can also be weak, they can be targets as well. So queen c8, e4, and white goes after the pawns, uh, bishop f8 here. If d4, I believe the idea was to advance with uh, knight to d5, using the power of the bishop on the diagonal, where if black takes this one, there's e takes d5, just for example, and then maybe white can try to play like knight c4 and, and push d6, bishop f4, this kind of thing. So this d-pawn can become pretty strong for white. Um, so black goes knight, uh, bishop f8. 
f4, d4, knight d5, knight takes d5, e takes d5, f6. Okay, so important moment. Um, if white goes knight c4, then I think the problem might be something like queen d7 and going after the d5 pawn, which might actually end up pretty weak. So Levon plays on f6, very nice move, rig d e1. And this might have been computer preparation, I'm not sure. The computer certainly approves of it, so that's why maybe this was something he, he might have cooked up at home. It's certainly not the most obvious idea at first glance. Uh, but he leaves the knight on e5 under attack because if black takes this one, white gets the second pawn to e5 and then is going to have two very strong pawns, d5, e5. Okay, so black takes. I mean, he can't really tolerate the knight for, for very long. If he plays like knight d7, for example, then white would be able to go knight c6. And this knight on c6 is very strong. So takes, takes. Knight d7. e6. Knight of six. So white has sacrificed the full piece now, and uh, two pawns on d5 and e6 are really strong, but black is threatening to take this one. So what to do? Well, the two pawns must be kept alive. So Levon goes ahead and sacrifices the rook just to take on f6, just to keep the pawns on d5, e6 alive. So takes queen f5. Okay, so now you guys can maybe see why I was reminded of this game <laughs> based on the game we were just looking at. So now we have these pawns. White has given up a full rook here. So no more exchange. You know, that's that's kindergarten. Here, Aronian has sacrificed the full rook. But these pawns are completely restricting all of black's pieces. The bishop is coming to e4. The rook can use the e4 square. And this is going to be really, really uh, devastating attack. Okay, queen d8, rook e4, rook e7, rook g4 check, king h8, bishop e4. So white just brings in everything. These pieces, again, or these pawns just dominating the board. Rook c8, rook h4. And uh, now it's just, notice white didn't even glance at this f6 pawn. Like we didn't even consider taking it because that would kind of give black's pieces like some some scope at some point. Although here already we're ready to take on h7, which means we're kind of ready to take on f6. And if black plays some move like rook c7 here, then we can take, and, and then if bishop g7, we have um, rook takes h7, for example, and yeah, lots of bad stuff. For example, uh, take, we take, and queen is hanging with checkmate. So game over, definitely game over. <laughs> Um, so Navarro played king g8, white takes on h7, bishop takes d5, just desperation, queen g6 check, rook g7, and then queen h5. Silky smooth, silky smooth, setting up the mate uh, on h8 using this pawn, and the queen of course, and the yeah, black just doesn't have a defense, so he took and, and was mated. So amazing game. Uh, really, really cool stuff from from Aronia just to like sack the full rook and, and then get these get these two pawns. So these two pawns, even though they're blockaded, their value is that they restrict the enemy pieces to such a degree that your pieces can then uh, totally dominate. Um, okay, Fred. Hopefully that was that was helpful. Um, all right, guys. I have a couple more games to go through here. So uh, let's see, I have three, from, one from MT Peb, one from Julio, and one from Ein, some Yager. Um, if you want to get in line, I'm not sure I'll have time to look at more than, than these three games necessarily, but uh, if you want to submit a game just in case, you can whisper to Chess Dojo Live. I will need the link. Okay, Julio. Let me download this game.
Okay. So Julio is asking about the middle game. Says I felt very uncomfortable in the middle game. Wasn't sure about what my plan was. Looked like I was building an attack, but I don't think it was sound and black could have stopped it at any point <laughs> with F5 or F6. So yada, yada, yada. What can I do? Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's take a look. So here we're playing white. Julio is about 2100, his opponent uh, 2130. Um, actually, is it, I'm sorry, is it Julio or Julio? <laughs> I've been saying Julio this whole time, but it could be Julio. I don't know. <laughs> Please help me. Okay, Bishop C4. So we're playing kind of um, Grand Prix attack style. A6, D3. Here. Now, one thing actually on a6, maybe we, we should be playing a4 here to uh, keep the bishop on on b5. Oh, it's Julio. Okay, my bad. <laughs> my bad. Um, so a4 might be the move you want here so you can keep your, your bishop uh, on the diagonal. And um, this one can can point and then you can play like f4, f5 and try to put pressure here. Um, so I think that's kind of the way, although I feel like a lot of players, I don't know 100% about the theory here. I feel like knight f3 is usually the move. And then if, um, I mean, if black doesn't take, let's say here, here, here. All right, you play bishop, bishop c4. Yeah, I think a lot of players, they go knight f3 and their idea is that if black takes on b5, then okay, you gave up the bishop, but you did get, you do have a lead in development, so you can still play this one uh, kind of like um, for the initiative. You can go d4 here. You can sometimes play d3 as well, but this is something worth checking out. I'm not a huge expert, again, on the theory, but that's just kind of what I've seen as a lot of players try, try knight f3. Um, but okay, you like bishop c4, e6, knight e2, um, castles, uh, a6, and yeah, I think maybe a4 would be the way to kind of keep keep the the pressure alive. Because if you give up the light squared bishop, I I don't know, I don't really believe in white's position at this point anymore. I just think black's light squared bishop is a very powerful piece, and I don't really see like what white has in terms of compensation. Like you can play f4, but for me, all it's doing is like just weakening the light squares on, on our king side. So d5, e5, we get this kind of French-like position. Now we go d4. Okay, well, this is important. And, and now I think white's position actually actually kind of makes sense. And now he just looks like a French. We've shut down the bishop on b7. My guess is black should have done something different. You know, they don't even have to play d5 here. They can also play um, d6 and, and keep the position more flexible. Um, but, uh, well, okay, we get this. We get d4. Takes, takes, bishop c5, bishop e3, uh, castles, queen g4. Now we basically have like a French type of position. So queen g4 makes sense playing on the king side. I like knight e2. I like knight e2 a lot, right? Just strengthening the knight on d4. Oops, sorry, it always takes me forever to get the arrows. So rook e8, rook f3, b4, rook g3, g6. Um h3, queen d8, f5, uh-oh. Yeah, it looks like we gave up a lot of pawns here, and we're not necessarily winning. Yeah, black just completely neutralized the attack. This knight on f8, very, very strong. Yeah, I guess we misplayed something. Let's take a look. Okay, one idea is to try to play um, h4, h5. I guess if we understand that rook h3 and queen h4 is kind of met with um, knight f8 and black is kind of solid. Yeah, next idea would be like to try to play h4, h5. The point here being um, to take on g6 and then, and then double on the h file because then you'll have queen h7 but also like queen h8. Uh, maybe this was the way to attack in this kind of position. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, like the your engine can tell you much better exactly how to how to break through here. Um, but 
Yeah, that's that's the difficulty with these attacking positions, right? It's like if you choose the wrong plan here, like rook h3, it simply doesn't work. We try f5, takes, and then I'm guessing we didn't take on f5 because black can take on e3 and then takes on e5 next move. And it feels like white just doesn't have anything. So this f5 break, although this is very thematic, doesn't feel like it was the way to go in this position simply because it, it gives up the e5 pawn. Black could also consider knight takes e5 and probably get away with this one too. I don't really see why this should be so dangerous um, for, for black necessarily. Uh, but what black did is, is fine. So this is basically, it seems like a case of, of just choosing the wrong, the wrong plan. Because um, we kind of need this pawn on f4 to keep e5 defended. And it just seems very difficult to, to get f5 in. Now, maybe if this knight was on f3 instead of e2, you control the e5 square, then it makes e5 a lot more uh, doable. And then that becomes a bigger, uh, a bigger plan. Or I guess more uh, has more potential. Um, yeah. The other move you can also throw in these positions, it's like rook a d1, because your rook just kind of, because this is your main blockading square, like the, the d4 square, so you do want all your pieces to kind of help. Maybe even rook a e1 is another way of like helping the, the e pawn in the long term. But this is just a small thing. I liked your plan, rook f3, uh, rook g3 very much. I think this, this definitely makes sense. Um, and then on g6, we simply, this is like a kind of like an economy of defense thing. Like if we use our rook and our queen to attack the h7 pawn, but black only needs a knight to defend it. And when we have this kind of thing, what that means is like, it's like our pieces are tied down to this task that the enemy only needs a knight for. And that means that black's queen and rooks are free to activate on the rest of the board. And that's why the attack can be... Uh, positionally, it, it doesn't really pay off for white because we're just left with these pieces on the E file that are just hanging. Black has a couple of extra pawns and yeah, nothing else is really going for a white's position. So this is why attack uh, attacking chess can be very risky because you do have to kind of burn some bridges and, and play for um, play for the win, knowing that if it doesn't work out, you, you might end up with a bad end game. Because of course, white could have kept, you know, the rooks on the first rank, go rook fd1, king h1, keep like a very solid position, but then it's much harder to win the game that way. If you want to win the game, that often comes with uh, taking some risk, but of course it doesn't always work out. So the plan was good, uh, Julio. I think this was all totally fine. Um, we just had to come up with a more, yeah, effective way to to break through. In this case, I think h4 it looks like a nice plan because this, this feels very annoying playing h5, opening the h file, and then doubling your pieces there. Maybe even one day playing king f2, if you think you can get away with it, and I think you probably could actually, with this knight on d4 being so solid, and bringing the other rook to the h file. Yeah. What happens if black tries to defend with f5? Let's take a look. Um, f5. So if we take on passant, probably knight takes... Um, and the knight gets the e4 square, so that's kind of annoying. Uh, I would imagine we pull back, let's say queen h3, for example, and then we just try to play h5 next move. I think we still get some, some pressure here with white. I kind of do actually really like the idea of this plan of playing king f2 and bringing this rook to h1 because the king does seem very safe on f2 here. This knight on d4 kind of holds everything down like black has no way to get at your king and then your rook can like open up on the h file. So this could be could be worth checking out. Okay, well, interesting game. Thanks for sharing. Um, I think something for everyone that could be useful in general is to try to find model games in the openings that you play 
see how strong players, you know, handle these kinds of like thematic typical attacking positions. In this case, it was kind of like a French type of structure. And yeah, trying to pick up some some ideas um, from those that can always be be super, super helpful. Um, OK, Julio, I hope that was I hope that was useful for you. OK, let's go to uh, MTPEB. And. Oh. MT, if you're still in the chat, I need the actual, I need the link to the actual game. I think you just linked me to like a chess.com page, like an opening page, but I need the, the game link, the game itself. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I think so. Yeah, okay, and okay, looks like we were playing white in this game. This was a G30 game. Cool. All okay, let's download the game. Okay, so we're playing white here. Both players rated around 900, 950 or so. Ooh, and we're playing kind of a stonewall setup. Okay. So big time stonewall. Uh, yeah, Julia, the, the queen g4 idea in rook f3 I thought was totally fine because you, you're completely in control over the center d4 square. So I think you're you're doing absolutely great here. Um, okay, speaking of good, I mean, uh, opening looks really nice for white. I think it's actually black who kind of messed up this opening, really neglecting uh, the light squared bishop. Uh, this is definitely a typical mistake we see around this level, like playing bishop d6 and not really creating a, a square for this bishop. It could still go to b6 and, and bishop b7, but still this bishop on d6 I think would be much better uh, placed on e7. And then black can play something like d5 and fight for their fair share of, of the center. Um, the real thing is that black is blocking the d-pawn. Okay, so we go c3, knight d2, knight f3, knight h5, and uh, g4. g4 not really necessary, uh, honestly, because like the knight on h5 is basically doing nothing. Like it doesn't attack anything, this pawn is defended, and it doesn't threaten to go to g3 because this square is defended. So since this knight is not threatening to do anything to us, I would just say it's a bad knight, and I would I would strongly think about just ignoring it. Uh, and just like castling, for example. And then our next move in this position, I think, would be knight to e5, putting the knight in the center, which would be a really strong square, and maybe even opening up the queen against this knight on h5, which would be hanging. Um, but g4, not a bad move. Uh, I mean, honestly, not bad. I just don't think super necessary. Knight f6. But once you play g4, I would say at this point, you should go ahead and play g5. Because <laughs> then this knight on h5, if black wants to go back, is still going to be a really, I think, bad piece on the side of the board. We can go knight e5 here, opening up the queen attacking this knight, maybe black plays g6, right, to defend it. And then with g6, black makes some weaknesses around the king that one day we can try to take advantage of with a move like uh, knight to g4, for example. And then this knight is looking at the h6 square. This knight could be looking at the f6 square. Maybe white has an idea to bring this knight to e4, and then the second knight to f6, and could be really, really powerful attack for white. Um, okay, h3, we keep the space, b6, knight c4, bishop b7, bishop d2, rook a8, queen a4. Okay, so queen a4 strikes me as odd because I don't really see what we're doing here. I think this is a case where white basically couldn't figure out 
the plan, like what to do, because all their individual moves kind of make sense. Like knight c4, bishop d2, even queen a4 on its own kind of makes sense. You're like bringing the queen out. But we can kind of see that like the queen is on the wrong side of the board. In this position, what white should be doing is attacking the king side. So white's pieces are pointed here, the pawns are already advanced, and white has a really nice grip over the center. So the queen should not be on the queen side. The queen should be looking to transfer over to the king side. So if we do a queen maneuver here, we'd want something like queen e2, queen g2, or pushing g5, and then trying to get the queen in to g4 or h4, like we saw in, in the previous game. So this would be the way for white to proceed in this position. Um, so queen a4, this is going in the wrong direction. Now we castle queen side. That goes knight a5. And oh, black finds a nice trick, knight a5, opening up against the knight on f3. So this one simply ends up hanging. So we lose the exchange here, and we end up actually end up down a rook. So kind of unfortunate tactic. It seems like we left this knight on f3 undefended. It actually it all comes back to this queen a4 move. Um I mean, I think this move is more of a like a strategic mistake because the queen shouldn't be on the queen side. We don't really have a lot to do here. The queen should be uh, over on the king side where you can actually put pressure against the king. Um, but beyond that, the other thing that the queen was doing was defending the stein on f3. And now black actually has this target. So already here, black maybe had some tactics like knight takes d4, for example and taking advantage of white's pieces on this diagonal. So this might have been like a tactical error as well. Um, that one's not so easy to see, so I wouldn't really blame you for missing that one, but it is something we want to keep in mind in general, uh, that all of our opponent's pieces, of course, have ideas of their own, and all of the opponent's pieces are always trying to do damage, right? So the opponent is always looking for possible pieces to attack, especially bishops are like snipers. You know, they're like long range pieces. They can attack anything on the diagonal. They're always looking for uh, for targets. So this is this is one we definitely had to watch out for. And credit to your opponent for finding this nice knight a5 move, which is kind of like a double attack, hitting the knight on f3 and the knight on c4. Looks like we got a little bit of tunnel vision here because we take this knight on e5, where probably the best move would have been simply to defend our own knight with like rook f1. Uh, for example, where we don't lose any material. We defend the knight on f3, and if knight takes c4, we can recapture this one, and we are uh, totally fine. What kind of move is queen a4? Well, queen a4, definitely strategic mistake, I would say, um, because the queen simply doesn't belong on, on that side of, of the board, and instead the queen would be better placed um, pointing towards the king side. But okay, I already made that point a million times. I don't want to beat a dead horse. I hope that's helpful for you, MT uh, PEB. Uh, I would say this is one where we kind of lose the thread a little bit uh, towards the end of the opening here. We need to decide where to put the king and we need to decide what to do. At this point, since you've already advanced your king side pawns, I would say the right plan was to push forward and hit the knight on uh, f6 and, and get your attack going even considering something like queen to c2 and putting pressure on, on h7. This could have been another way to play the position um, with the threat of pushing g5 and going after uh, this pawn. Um, okay, ho hopefully that was helpful. Uh, let's see, guys, we are actually going to be wrapping up the show pretty soon. Um, So I don't think I'm going to have time for too many more games. I think I'm just going to do one more um, from uh, Ein Sam, just because they've been waiting. And uh, Ein Sam Yager, if you are still in the chat, if you can actually please send me a link to your game rather than the PGN, because the full PGN, they can't. Twitch whispers can't take it. So I need just a link to the game so I can go and grab it. Sorry, yeah, but I do this show every week so you can come back every Thursday, 3.30 p.m. Pacific time and submit games. So if you didn't get a chance today, 
uh, you will get a chance next week. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you guys for the compliments on the board. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I can't believe no one uses this one. This, this is available on Chess24. I think it's very aesthetic board, very aesthetic. <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't uh, haven't discovered this one yet. Um, okay, let's take a look at this game. And it uh, looks like, uh, I think we were playing white in this game, if I'm not mistaken. And let's paste this one in. Okay. So um, I'm just gonna call you Sam. <laughs> Sam is playing uh, white, would like to know what they should be looking for in the middle game and how do I create opportunities for captures? The difference with the real game and puzzle solving is that I know a solution exists for puzzles, but how do I, do I determine when the same opportunities arise in an actual game? Yeah, good question, Sam. This is actually one I talked about at length on um, the YouTube channel that I uh, do videos for, Chess Dojo. I'm just going to shamelessly plug it. If you go to youtube.com slash chess dojo, there's also the channel that I stream for normally, Chess Dojo Live on Twitch. Uh, which you guys should go and and follow. Um, uh, I actually talked about this question in terms of how to improve your tactical sense and like find tactics during the game. Because of course you never know when there's gonna be a tactic, but you do wanna develop a sense of like trying to calculate and be calculating on every single move and looking for opportunities basically on every single move, just using what you can in your opponent's position. And I encourage people to play longer time controls in general. If you're playing faster time controls, even something like 10 minutes, that's not a lot of time to actually look at the board and calculate. 10 minutes is pretty quick. So if you want more time to kind of develop your calculation and give yourself a chance to like spot tactics at the board, I would recommend playing longer games, maybe just once a week playing a game like 30 minutes, 45 minutes per side, it's a bit of a time commitment, but this is what allows you to like develop your depth of thinking and especially your calculation. When in a rapid game, you have to recognize things very quickly. That's not easy to do if you haven't really worked on it for uh, a lot. Um, so let's take a look at this game. So we have uh, Queen's Gambit declined, Knight of three, Bishop B4, Bishop D2, takes on C4, Knight E5, takes on D4. Black grabs a second pawn, Queen A4 check though, Bishop d7, queen takes b4. Whoa, Sam, what do you mean? Your tactics are good. <laughs> Your tactics are good. You found queen a4 check, bishop d7. And uh, you took here, takes, queen takes b7. And now we're winning uh, material. We're hitting the rook on a8. Or if bishop c6, we got queen c8 check, and we take here. But we lost this game, so something happened. Something dramatic happened. Um, I would just want to point out one option we could have considered was knight takes d7, maybe simpler. Just first eliminating our knight on e5 that was kind of hanging. Trading this one, and then when black takes, then we just pick up a piece for free. But okay, queen takes b4, queen e5. We win a rook, actually, so we win a rook. g6. Now we've won material. This is basically the technical phase of the game. We want to develop. E3 is good. Knight d7, queen g7, knight c5, bishop c4, h5, castles, rook g8, queen h6, queen gets out. We're still up the rook. But g5, black doesn't let us. Uh, we go f4. Oh, I am beginning to see what happened here. Takes, takes, rook takes g2 out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, this rook on the G file ends up ends up wrecking White's position. Very unfortunate. Uh, I, it's an understandable blunder, right? Like we played F4. F4 is a good move in, in spirit, like opening up our queen on H6. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the G2 pawn is hanging, so it just doesn't work for for White. Um, 
Yeah, a bit of a shame. I mean, other options include like something like knight e2 that we could have played here, and then the idea would be to go bishop c3 next. So knight e2, black does something. Our next move is bishop c3, hitting the queen and the knight. So this would have probably won the game for white. Um, there is rook g6 that we have to kind of calculate. But yeah, rook g6, I think you can just go bishop c3. Sometimes this is a little bit tricky to calculate, but we are up the rook here, so we have uh, quite a bit of, of leeway. Um, like if queen takes here, then we go here, for example. And we gave back some material, but we're still up the exchange, and we should have, now that we've traded off queens, we should be completely winning here. Like rook fc1, for example, and the rook on the c file is going to be doing some damage. Black's rook on h6 now out of the game. So it wasn't easy to win this position, but um, yeah, kind of unfortunate that we, we ended up blundering into this. It happens though, it happens. Um, now the question was how to actually find opportunities in the middle game. I mean, I feel like <laughs> White did a good job of that here. Um, I mean, in, in general, I would refer you to that, that longer YouTube video I made on, on this topic, but the idea is that you're working on your tactics at home. You're solving a lot of tactics on your own. And then during the game, you're actively looking for tactics basically on every move. And you're just looking for any possibility that you can. So whenever your opponent makes a move, you're just, you do a quick glance, you do a quick tactics check. Is there something hanging there? Do I have any forcing moves? Basically you want to be looking at those forcing moves almost every turn and uh, checking to see if there are any tactical opportunities. And if there is something there, then you can kind of focus in on it and try to calculate a little bit um, deeper. But that would be my main advice for you. Uh, try to play longer time control games so you have more time to calculate and, and uh, look at different variations in your mind, work on your analysis skills. And then during the game, you really have to try to be vigilant and be looking for patterns and tactics. Basically any move using anything in your opponent's position that you can justify. Maybe you have a possible check, possible capture, something is vulnerable. A lot of stuff you can use to kind of point to you in the in the right um, direction. But you got to also solve a lot of tactics in training. That's what helps you develop this kind of tactical sense, uh, pattern recognition, and so on. Uh, am I still doing the woodpecker method cycles? No, I just did that for the one month. It's funny actually, like everyone always asks me about the woodpecker and they're like, oh, is it, is it a good method? Is it like, is it worth it? And it's like, just try it. It's like one month. <laughs> it's one month of your life, you know? Just try it, see? <laughs> it's, it's not a big deal. I think people have spent more time arguing about the woodpecker method than, um, than it would take to like, just do one. <laughs> But yeah, it's basically one month of your life. You know, you dedicate to doing two hours of calculation a day. And yeah, by the end of it, you've done two hours of calculation a day for the full 30 days. You know, how could that be bad? <laughs> All right, guys, I actually am going to be wrapping up the stream here. Um, once again, uh, I do this show every Thursday, 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, where I look at uh, viewer games and we just analyze some, some middle games, some positions, answer some questions, and try to find um, moments that are instructive for everybody. Um, okay, last question. What tactics would I recommend? Puzzle Rush, Puzzle Storm, or Normal Tactics Trainer? I mean, I think they're all good depending on what, what you want, right? The Puzzle Rush, Puzzle Storm, that's really good for like quick tactics. And then Normal Tactics is good for uh, kind of slightly more uh, challenging problems as well. Though if you want the really hard stuff, then you got to look at, look at chess books, of course. Um, okay, guys, I will be back next Thursday. If you missed previous episodes, you can find them up on my YouTube channel. Uh, just searching Diagnose Your Chess. And I am Kosti Kowitski. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. I will catch you guys next time. Have a good one.